Why is this in black and white? Because today we're reviewing Frankenstein. Oh yeah, because that's real clever. The Universal Monster movies are amongst the most influential in film history. Everybody knows who Frankenstein, Dracula, the Wolfman is. Even little kids. They'll be remade, reimagined, and rebooted till the end of time. But how do the original films hold up? Over a hundred years ago, the Thomas Edison Film Company made an adaptation of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. At about 11 to 15 minutes, it was one of the longest movies made that year. It was silent, so most of the philosophical themes so beautifully developed in Shelley's novel were left out of the movie. Instead, we get to see Victor Frankenstein making his monster in the bathtub. The effect was achieved by burning a wax mannequin of the monster and then showing the film in reverse. Showing the film in reverse? That, that was some James Cameron state-of-the-art special effects. People back then had their minds blown. Once the monster is created, Dr. Frankenstein gets cold feet. He banishes the monster, calling it evil, which is kind of unfair. I mean, the monster hasn't done anything. The creature spends the whole movie trying to reconnect with his creator, only to be cast aside. It kind of makes Frankenstein look like a dick. And a crummy scientist. Like, what was the point of making the creature in the first place if he was just going to chicken out? I love this scene here, where the monster appears over Dr. Frankenstein's bed. It sort of reminds me of the horse head emerging from the curtain in that famous painting, The Nightmare, by Fusilli. A mere 20 years later, we had sound and stars, so Universal Pictures adapted a successful Broadway play into one of the most famous horror movies of all time. Sadly, Dracula does not hold up well. When kids today say they don't want to watch black and white movies because they're old and boring and they suck, well, don't show them Dracula, because it's kind of all those things. The movie is very, very slow and the story isn't fully resolved. And because movies back then didn't have musical scores, there are long stretches where the soundtrack is filled with nothing but the hiss of the analog recording. Scenes that are supposed to be frightening or dramatic just come off as awkward. So how does Frankenstein hold up? Made only a year later, one worries that it'll be plagued by the same problems that sink Dracula. Let's have a look. The movie gets off on the wrong foot, when the source is credited, from the novel by Miss Percy B. Shelley. What? They don't credit her as Mary Shelley, but after her husband? It's not like she didn't have a famous name too. Well, what if they still credited women that way? And the Academy Award for Best Actress goes to Mrs. Dawn Gummer. I'll get that. That's my speech. That was just me there. Okay. <laughs> right from the start, Frankenstein works beautifully. Thanks to an amazing set that's really a work of art, the opening graveyard scene is atmospheric and creepy. Gravedigger didn't really do a good job leveling that out. Look at that slob Henry throwing dirt all over the statues. Unlike Dracula, Frankenstein makes terrific use of sound to bring scenes to life. In this opening scene, we've got the church bells, the mourners, the sound of dirt hitting the coffin. And then in the creation scene, you got a mad storm, the electrical equipment going kablooey. It's a madhouse. The scene is exciting, as opposed to... The movie makes a big deviation from Mary Shelley's novel. One I'm not sure if I like or not. Henry sends his assistant, Fritz, to go steal a fresh brain. 
Fritz goes to the doctor's school and selects a plump one, but... Oops, I dropped oh. it! Ah, man. Oh, well, uh, no worries. Uh, there's another brain right here. I'll just grab it. Oh, no! Abnormal brain! Now, in the book, Victor Frankenstein had only himself to blame for the tragedy caused by the monster. The movie is much more forgiving of him. Part of it being the suggestion that the monster would have turned out better had he just not been given the abnormal criminal brain. But then, the monster doesn't really do anything bad. He isn't criminal, he's just kind of retarded. He walks slow, he's docile, he wouldn't hurt a fly, he just wants to bask in the warm sun. He does kill Fritz, but we've seen Fritz torturing him with fire, because Fritz is an asshole. Then he meets a young girl and throws her in the water. Stupid, but not malicious. Now he's got a hundred maniacs waving torches and chasing him to the top of a windmill. Some criminal mastermind. So the movie winds up working just like Mary Shelley's novel, where the monster's evil is mostly the cause of the shabby treatment by his creator. It makes the abnormal brain switch wind up being pointless. At least it's a good scene for Dwight Fry, whose performance steals every shot he's in. I love the way he stops on his way to answer the door to pull up his sock. Unfortunately, the movie can't be all graveyards and lumbering monsters, so we get scenes devoted to Henry's personal life. While he's up at the castle doing God knows what with Fritz, his fiancée Elizabeth is worried. I am living in an abandoned old watchtower close to the town of Goldstadt. Only my assistant is here to help me with my experiments. Oh, his experiments? Yes, that's what frightens me. The very day we announced our engagement, he told me of his experiments. He said he was on the verge of a discovery so terrific that he doubted his own sanity. Still, I worry I can't help it. That's the kind of letter he's sending home to her? What, does he want her to be worried? And I'm really suspicious of this friend, who's always hanging around Elizabeth. Check out the creepy way he just stares at her this entire scene. He's obviously trying to hone in on Henry's girl. You know I'd go to the ends of the earth for you. I shouldn't like that. I'm far too fond of you. I wish you were. Oh, it's so embarrassing the way he hits on her and she has to pretend she didn't notice. Ugh, I'm getting douche chills. Good night, Victor, and thank you. Thank you. If there's one scene that cries out for a musical score, it's the first appearance of the monster. It lacks the oomph necessary for such a reveal. The series of jump cuts moving closer and closer to his face are a good idea, but they don't quite work. A movie this intense needs some comic relief, so they haul in Henry's senile old coot of a father. You think I'm an idiot, don't you? Is that the front door? God, shh! When the monster kills Fritz, Henry finally washes his hands of the whole deal. He abandons his creation and lounges with Elizabeth in luxury, preparing for their wedding. The whole village is excited for the forthcoming nuptials, holding a huge Oktoberfest celebration. Is Henry like the prince of the village or something? Who gives a shit if he gets married? Now after the staginess of Dracula, I'm really impressed by these ambitious tracking shots through the village square. Despite his abnormal criminal brain, the gentle monster plays with the little girl, tossing flowers into the water. Then the monster gets excited and tosses her in as well. No, you're hurting me! No! Oops. Such savagery. I bet audiences in 1931 had their minds blown. Except they didn't, because the scene was considered too horrible and was cut out, which created more of a problem. Because we last see the little girl with the monster, and then later we cut to this? And the audience assumes the monster raped and killed her. Now that's way over the line. And I have to wonder, what kind of kid can't swim? 
They didn't have TVs or the internet, so you'd think learning to swim would be something all the kids would do. I mean, she doesn't even try. The monster throws her in, she sinks like a rock. What does she have for breakfast? Cement? Despite a strong beginning, right about here is where the movie starts to fall apart. Henry! Dr. Baldman! What about Dr. Baldman? Henry, don't leave me! Don't leave me! No, darling, you stay here. Henry! Henry! Why is Henry locking her in? He doesn't know the monster's escaped yet. They're not even married, and already he's treating her like one of his creations. Is this how Henry is going to solve every problem in his life? Just locking it away in a cell? If I were Elizabeth, I would take this as a huge warning sign to not get married. I love you so. Sure. Why exactly does the monster attack Elizabeth? Is it just random that he bumps into her? I guess he's supposed to be seeking revenge on Henry, but does he even know where Henry lives? How does he know Elizabeth is his bride? Does the monster's infantile brain even grasp concepts like matrimony? This part of the story really isn't developed very well. Now the father shows up with his dead, not raped, daughter, and... She's been murdered! Wait, how does he know she's been murdered? I mean, if she couldn't swim, it was probably only a matter of time before something awful happened to her. But the mob is quick to anger. Listen to them. The way they're reacting, you'd think O.J. was just found not guilty. This is the only other part of the movie that would benefit from a musical score. It starts out good with the sound of the mob, heightening the drama, but it isn't enough to sustain the chase. The pacing feels off, and there isn't much excitement. You feel like you're just watching random shots of people running past the same rock set over and over. And the monster's motivations at the end are unclear. If he's mad at Henry, why doesn't he just kill him? Why drag him to the windmill? For a movie that started so strong, it ends not making a whole lot of sense. I thought the monster took Henry because he wanted him to make another monster for him, so he wouldn't be lonely. That was in Bride of Frankenstein. The audiences in 1931 wouldn't have known about any of that. They just would have said, uh, cool movie, but uh, the ending wasn't so hot. And speaking of endings that aren't so hot, 